So the idea of today's session is to talk about the ethics of international uh, business. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is, in an open uh, session, just start to develop the topic before we break into groups at our tables and then talk in smaller groups about some of the things that we might want to talk about. All of us who are members of those professional bodies have a code of ethics that we are accountable to ourselves, to our fellow members and to our institutes for our behavior and our integrity. The stakeholder groups we should be thinking about are society, represented very often by consumers, employees, and we had in the session earlier in the day, if those of you who were participating, where we talked about the challenge of labor laws, about um, trafficking, human trafficking, about zero hours contracts and the lack of protections for, uh, for employees. But we also have a responsibility to other stakeholders. That might be government and regulators, NGOs. But also, and this may be one that we might be a little bit controversial, but I do want to make sure we cover it is, businesses have a responsibility to their shareholders. And ultimately, businesses will not survive if they don't take account of the requirements of all stakeholders. The idea of Chartered Accountants Worldwide is an organization that can bring together uh, various chartered bodies with a view to serving members, but also serving the needs of the customer base of the various bodies. It's an opportunity to both identify and then develop the standards that are recognized internationally, and not just accounting standards, but standards around behavior. So actually, the level of qualification that's seen in different markets is an essential ingredient in this conversation. Making sure that people as they train and become accountants or can represent themselves as accountants or chartered accountants, that you can recognize that brand and understand what you can expect of people who use that brand. People do business with brands they trust. And people should choose who they work for on the basis of brands they trust. Now, for a brand re-company, sometimes you know exactly who the company is, sometimes you see the brand, but you should also recognize who are the companies uh, behind the brand. Many of you will be involved in companies in a professional capacity, so there's also the role of how you as an individual can influence, and also how through various organizations that you may be a member of, which might be business related, or may, they may be societal organizations or NGOs, how you can also be part of the solution. Because one of the things about One Young World is, it's not good enough to identify what the problem is. The reason why we come together every year is to be part, an active part, of delivering the solution. So my objective at the end of the session is not to confirm that we all, what we all know is that there are challenges on ethics in the corporate world, what I'd like us to do is to contribute to how we, to one your world, but how each one of you personally can be accountable for being part of the change that we need to ensure the ethics of the corporate world match our expectations. But what I want to do is to try to make this a global conversation. Absolutely bring your insight from your own marketplace, your own culture, your own environment. You can't have an ethical industry that sits in isolation from an ethical community, society, and economy. It has to be right across everything and everyone. So, aspects of integrity, just to give you some thoughts. Moral values, and that itself is an interesting question because the mores of different societies are different. So, moral values, motives, profit motive, social motive, interesting. Commitments. If you sign up to be a chartered accountant, you make a commitment to stand by the ethical code. If you want to publish your accounts, if you want to be listed on the stock exchange, you sign up to certain commitments. If you want to do business in certain industries and in certain markets, you sign up to certain commitments. But that doesn't necessarily mean that those commitments are always honored. Qualities and achievements. So those were some thoughts about the components and aspects of integrity. So to give you a sense of the behaviors that go with those, some examples. To be honest and truthful, 
to be fair and equitable, to comply with laws, to promote community interests, to be open and adaptable, to be willing to take corrective action, and to both show and behave consistently. And the drivers that the Institute identified were leadership, strategy, policies, information, and culture. I think one, one of the major things with ethics is it's so easy to get lost in the day-to-day -day and get lost in the practices that you see around you and not ask why you're doing it and ask kind of what the ultimate impact of that, that process is. And sometimes when you stand back, the, the, I, the intention might be right, but the way you're getting there might not be the right way to do it. I ask myself, if my decision-making process for this was published, and the people who were affected by this decision saw how I made that decision and why I made that decision, would I feel proud to stand over that decision? The best definition of culture is what happens when people are like when people are having a conversation which is about the ethical nuances of a question, probably that organization is lost already. So that's a personal view, but that's maybe something we should also take out. So that concept of how you embed values and behaviors in a way that it's just what happens around here, rather than presume that Ronya is going to arrive and help you at that moment of truth to get you to address the big picture instead of getting lost in the detail. I hate with a passion the concept of CSR because it implies that doing the right thing isn't part of what you do in your core business. And I fundamentally believe that good business is always about doing the right thing. And there's no such thing as a sustainable business if you don't. It doesn't even matter. You could be bringing in millions of dollars for the company, but if the behavior is not there and the ethics aren't there, then we really, you won't do well at our company. So in theory, the brightest and best and most attractive recruits are saying that they will only work with organizations whose values meet their expectations. So if the company had, didn't already have a reason to act ethically, the prospect of never being able to employ the best people must surely be a catalyst in the HR community and inside the leadership of the organization to aspire to always be the most attractive employer in their sector. As we move towards a sustainable future in the United States, um, there's a lot of indifference um, towards the climate change issue that we're facing. And um, in countries like the United Kingdom, they are required to issue sustainability reports. Um, whereas that is not a requirement in the United States, um, and as well as in other countries, it's not a requirement to be listed on the stock exchange. But um, I'm interested in the discussion about whether that should be a requirement, whether um, as accountants, um, if we should develop uh, key performance indicators that would have a monetary value um, and contri contribute to a greater understanding about um, what businesses are doing and sort of even moving away from that CSR and making it embedded within uh, our businesses. We have been able to influence standards within our own industry and get some of our competitors to adopt in common with us certain standards, for example, the eco rating of all of the devices we sell within our retail stores. Working with all manufacturers in the world, except for Apple, <coughs> um, we're able to produce an eco rating on a consistent basis with information that's provided by each device manufacturer of its supply chain, so that a customer can choose, among other things, to consider the eco impact and environmental impact of one device over another at the point of purchase. And that's an example of where, by taking a voluntary step, we're actually starting to create a de facto industry standard. And what will be really interesting, that debate between uh, an obligation and creating de facto standards. Sometimes when you create an obligation, everybody moves to comply with the obligation and won't spend a dollar to move above the obligation. Whereas if you create an industry standard, that standard very often evolves with competition such that continue it allows for continuous improvement. Is it acceptable for companies to have solely a profit purpose in the absence of a social purpose? And that's a really, really interesting question. 
you see my look, so the company that I'm responsible for is listed in New York and listed in Spain. And the subsidiary in the UK is under the UK Companies Act. I have a fiduciary responsibility under the law to maximize the return on those assets on behalf of the shareholders. It's a legal requirement. Now, some people would interpret that as a reason as to why they need to maximize profit at the expense of a social purpose. My argument is that there is no sustainable profit stream on earth that doesn't have within it embedded a social conscience and a social responsibility. For big companies, it's really important to have a lot of detailed processes that allow you to recognize what's going on in the parts of the business you can't see. None of those are an alternative to personal accountability and leadership. And the best thing you can do in your startup is be you. Because within five minutes, everybody will know that if they want to work with your business or do business with you, they will understand your values and they will choose your business more likely because of your clear articulation of those values. And that's the best possible way. In this room, I'm pretty sure 90% of the people are still using Apple. And we know what they do. And even if they did something worse, odds are we'll still use it. So when consumers don't react, and you being you know, running such a global organization, so when consumers don't react on whatever you do, and even if you're doing the wrong thing, and you can make a bigger profit off of it, and nobody's reacting, and nobody would care. So don't you think like it's a consumer's responsibility to care? It's great to say that consumers hold, need to hold businesses to account, and I said it earlier in the day. What we have to acknowledge is that not every consumer can afford the cost of holding those corporates to account. And therefore, if we're saying it's a tax on the consumer, then that's not fair either. So we have to find a way of acting as a proxy for the consumer, for those of us who can afford to pay the tax or to make the choice, to act in loco the individual consumer to try to ensure that we move the agenda forward. But if corporations won't hold themselves to account, should we expect the person that's the furthest down the chain to hold them to a higher standard than they hold themselves? That's a tough one. But I think the principle is right. And my consumers hold me to account every single day. And that's why I make sure that they understand what sort of business I have. And we have the happiest customers, and we have the most loyal customers in any major telecommunications market in Europe. A lot of the time, organizations feel that they can do what they can get away with. Um, and the same with governments in many cases. So how can we make people become more accountable to share information and be transparent? Anglo-Saxon model is a principles-based model which relies on judgment. The US model, which is the most commonly adopted when it goes to international standards and others, is a rules-based model. And there's a really interesting debate inherent within that as to whether or not you are better protected by principles or rules. If you love your job, that's, that's a great feeling and accepting that your job is part of your life. But is it unethical of me to feel the need to feel loved at work and for me to feel valued? And if, I, if I'm not feeling valued in my corporate environment, how do I deal with that? How do you get the best out of your employees? Well, unloved, unrecognized, and unrewarded is unlikely to be the model. But it's also an environment in which you are much more exposed to behaviors that don't align with the company's values. So if you create a condition in which your employees do not feel bound to the values of the organization, then the danger that they will do something which will disrupt those values and damage the company is much higher. No matter what environment you're in, the first person that you're accountable to is yourself. And I think sometimes there's a presumption when people start their careers that there's an element of outsourcing responsibility for your development to your employer. Actually, the primary responsibility for you and who you are and what you stand for is yourself. The desire to be your best you is the asset that every employer seeks. And you will be amazed and inspired by the response that you will get from good employers who see people whose desire it is to bring their best self to work. And the thing I find really interesting about FIFA and the world of football mm -hmm. is, and you know, this is opinion, you know, I think it's founded on cheating. You know, if you YouTube any video of like a, a reel of diving, 
you will see that read into the game of football, the players cheat. Every single game you'll see a player take a dive for a free kick to benefit their team to take a further step in that game. Yet, it is the most loved sport in the world, it is the most played sport in the world, it is the most supported, it is got the biggest franchises of any other sport. So why is that? It's very easy to look away, right? I think it's very easy to look away from what's right in front of us. It's very easy to follow. And if something's not right, does that just mean because the other guy's doing it, I should do it as well? And when it comes to ethics and, um, and corporation and companies, we're at a turning point right now where there's a lot of government that are privatizing industry, that their resources are getting smaller, and larger corporations are going to take on a greater responsibility uh, to support some of the wicked problems in the world. And so that responsibility is, I think, what our generation has a, a major uh, step to sort of help that transition um, and make sure that we don't sort of leave the world the way that FIFA has become. Being a chartered accountant, it's ingrained in you that you're responsible and you have, need to act with integrity. Like the corporations will have their own brands, the chartered accountants, it's their integrity and ethics, which is their brand. I'm working in healthcare, and specifically this industry is an industry where ethics become a bit of a subjective point of view. You are a company, you're investing a lot of money in research and development, and at the end of it, a remedy that doesn't cost you a lot to manufacture is manufactured at a very expensive price. And thus, creates a problem of ethics, because a lot of people which are sick would benefit from that medicine. At the same time, your profit is also the long-term social gain that you're going to bring to society through innovation, through R&D. So, you hear about a lot about people saying these prices are not ethical. At the same time, you cannot have progress if you don't have these prices. Every industry has its own questions like that, but I think I would always challenge if the, the organization and if the industry has a clarity of its uh, higher or common purpose, then they can always find ways of balancing those difficult questions further down the line. If there isn't that sense of responsibility to start with, then it's almost impossible to get into the debate about how they can move further to address some of the bigger issues. How do companies make employees understand the common purpose that they're working for? When you lose sight of your customer, then you are in the position of, am I doing this for us or am I doing it for them? It's amazing. All of us are customers as well as employees. And we have an innate sense of what a customer would want, whether it be in banking, whether it be in telecommunications, whether it be in pharmaceuticals, healthcare, whatever it is. So I always think, put yourself in the shoes of the customers at a good start. Is it logical to be ethical when your economy is getting adversely affected for your decision? So you start with the people who are most affected, and you ask them what they would like to do. There were some good examples in the UK economy when the UK, although many of you will have assume that the UK fared relatively better than some other economies during the global downturn. There was significant dislocation in the UK economy. And there were a number of companies who um, very publicly discussed with their employees the difference between the necessary cuts in their cost associated with the downturn in their business and whether that should be achieved through redundancies or through uh, cuts in wages. What would be the most complicated situation you have been faced uh, about ethics and how to manage it when you have uh, owners of the company uh, that want to get better results, but you know that sometimes it's, I don't know, it's not ethics? We have 25 million customers in the UK, and on the um, 10th of July, 2012, not that I remember the specific day, <laughs> um, 9.7 million of those customers, sorry, 7.9 million of those customers lost service. And they lost service for about 19 hours. And at that situation, the question is, and it ultimately is ethics in the sense of who in the business holds themselves to account. And I had to make the decision as to whether or not it was in the best interests of the customers and the shareholders and my employees as to whether my holding myself accountable was to resign or to take responsibility for solving the problem. I chose to do the latter. 
and I therefore went on live television and I held myself account in front of our customers, not the interested public, but I went out and spoke to our customers and I told them what I was doing and why I was doing it and I allowed them the opportunity to tell me whether or not they thought I was doing the right thing. We have had tragedies in Paris, in Sharm el Sheikh and other things recently. We choose in those situations to take those customers who've been affected and choose to zero rate all of their communications so that no O2 customer who was stuck in Sharm el Sheikh had to worry about whether or not they were going to have an expensive bill when they got home. And none of our customers who were trying to ring Sharm el Sheikh or none of our customers who were either in Paris or were ringing Paris would have paid for any of their phone calls. The last thing we would want was for us to be part of the problem at a moment of truth because we need to be their trusted partner, somebody that they can rely on. So that's what we do. And it's not about, we don't make big publicity announcements about it, we just go quietly. Yes. In the future, technology will replace people. Many people would love to lose their job. And in opinion, is it ethical to eliminate people by robot or machine? And I'm very, very confident that once we get over the excitement about the technology, the social opportunity for change that it creates and behavioral change will be phenomenal but that there will be roles for all of us in a newly defined purpose. And it may be working differently, it may be working less, but if we can create um, efficiency in our economy, productivity and creativity through the harnessing of technology, then actually the element of labor which is associated with the lowest of the levels on Maslow's hierarchy of needs can actually be addressed in a way that may allow us to address the inequalities there are between the richer parts of the world and the poorer parts of the world because of more effective creativity, productivity, and value creation. So in many ways, I think it's an entirely positive thing Then there will be bumps on the road. I said five years ago to our sales team, I said, every one of you at the sales conference, put your hand up for a key contact that you'd be trying to get boardroom access to either increase the relationship or to break through and start a relationship with that company. And I got everyone to put their hand up. And then I said to them, every one of you can have one meeting with me, which you can offer to the chief executive of that company to come and talk about sustainability and corporate and social responsibility. And every single one who took up the offer got a boardroom meeting. And there's a good example of doing the right thing is the right thing to do. It's good for your business and it helps others. I'd love to come out of here with some clear actions that we can all have, as well as holding every single one of you to account for what you do. What is ethics? Yeah, it's, it's the right thing to do, but what exactly is ethics? So I actually took up a book, I read about it, and it actually summed up what we have talked about. It had, there are three layers to ethics, according to the book. The first one is the government, but sometimes what is legal might not be ethical, correct? So the second layer that we look into is the society, society which includes the companies, but many of us have highlighted that some companies are not exactly that ethical either. So the third layer that the book actually mentioned is personal, which means you and I, and like what Ron said. Keep talking, I'm going to write them down. Oh, yeah. And what, like what Ronan has said, the first person that you're accountable to is yourself. So if every of single one of us in this room is ethical, then, which is why we are in the one young world, then I think the world will be a better place. So it is about government, society, and the individual. But we have to make sure that each one of those <coughs> communities is willing to make a difference so that it exerts the pressure on the others in the ecosystem to correspondingly move forward and then we will all move forward together. My experience of regulation is that regulation is imposed at moments of market failure and regulators by their nature are usually the least qualified for um, the operation of efficient markets. So you move from one failure which is a market failure, to a second failure, which is a regulatory failure. If I could ask each one of you to commit to paper the one thing that you are going to do differently as a result of today and as a result of your time in Bangkok, 
It's been a huge privilege for me to be involved in One Young Warrior for a while, but this is one of the most rewarding uh, sessions that I've been in because what I see is the innate integrity of this generation of people who know themselves what the right thing to do is. How do we, therefore, harness that within a business? And one of the things I'll take away is how do I make sure that the voice of integrity, which is innate within this generation of people, can be louder inside my business and inside other businesses that I'm involved in. I understand the innate capabilities of this generation to change the world from their native digital literacy. What I now am going to do is recognize that their native integrity is also something that we have to give a voice to and allow that to be a clarion cry for those of my generation to change our behavior to match the expectations of all.